most of the day you've been hearing about QCAs. And when you have a QCA, it maps local operators to strictly local operators, meaning they have some strictly local support. And I'll be talking about the case when we relax that condition and we have some fuzzily localized support. Um, please ask questions. Everyone says that, but to convince you that I'm serious, I have two example questions. If you're a mathematician, you could ask, what's the Heisenberg picture, if I use those words? Or if you're a physicist, you could ask, what's the operator norm? Those are just two examples. If you're a mathematician, then you have to Yeah, yeah. Any, anyone can ask anything. So first, I'll review QCAs a little bit, just in case uh, I know repetition helps if it's a new concept. And then I'll try to convince you to think about approximate locality. Actually, I'll start by trying to convince you a little bit right now. So I'll talk about how a physical Hamiltonian evolution leads to this fuzzy light cone that requires this approximate notion of locality. But I want to suggest that even more generally, techniques like I'm going to talk about for taking fuzzy locality and making it strict, I have some hope that they could be more broadly applicable because often in these problems on lattices, we have, it's easier when we have, say, zero correlation length or an exact light cone. Whereas when, whereas more naturally, we're gonna have some non-zero correlation length or some fuzzy light cone. And if we had some sort of general toolbox for taking these fuzzy things and sharpening them, that could be good for solving problems. So, I'll also teach you a tiny bit of operator algebra, if you don't know. The main goal would be to understand the index theory of approximate QCAs in 1D. And then I'd be especially happy if anyone has ideas for how to talk about higher dimensions, or uh, I'll, I'll list some more open problems as I go along. Most of the, I'll review some things, but most of the new material is work with uh, these two collaborators, Michael Walter and Freak would have been. And we, I'll also be talking about the original GNVW index written by the GNVW authors. And we're also helped out a lot by this paper on perturbations of operator algebras, which is by Eric Christensen. It's a paper from the 1980s, and he's a Danish mathematician. A quick summary of the questions and answers. So the physics question that I want to ask is just, are local dynamics generated by local Hamiltonians? And I'll be a little bit more precise about what that means. And then the sort of straightforward mathematical physics question is just, can we, can we classify approximate QCAs? And so far, what we can do is we can approximate 1D QCAs. And the punchline I'll tell you already is it turns out that this classification very closely resembles the strict case classification. So I'll talk to you about an index, which is basically just the GNBW index, but upgraded to deal with these tails. And the good news, if you think it's good, is that this classification is robust and it holds up in the fuzzy case. I mean, maybe it would have been fun to see that it broke down or to come up with a new classification. On the other hand, it's also sort of nice that it was robust. And then, like I said, uh, higher dimensions are still an open question. The setup, like it was for a lot of today, is some Hilbert space, which is a tensor product of local Hilbert spaces. They'll be finite dimensional. They don't all need to be the same dimension. And then for the next few slides, I'll be talking about Hamiltonian evolution. It'll be very familiar to all the physicists, but I'm gonna have a local Hamiltonian, so like a nearest neighbor Hamiltonian on a spin chain. In case these words pass you by, a local operator, to be totally clear, is an operator like this, where it's I the identity everywhere except for some handful of sites. And then the support of the operator refers to the sites on which the operator is not the identity. So in this little example, the support of this operator A would be this site I. Now, what happens when we evolve an operator with a local Hamiltonian? Well, let's say we start with this operator A that's localized to a single site. Here, and then times in the vertical axis, we choose some fixed time interval t0, and then we evolve it, which means we conjugate the operator by this e to the iht. That's what evolution of an operator means to physicists. And then what happens generally is the support grows a little bit. And then you evolve it more in time, you conjugate it again, and the, and the support grows more. 
and this growing support of the operator in time, we often call the light cone. Basically because it's evocative in special relativity of how light goes out in a cone. Now, the main point of this is that I actually lied to you a little bit. It's just an approximate light cone when you're on a lattice with a local Hamiltonian. So the operator A at time t is not quite localized within this cone. It actually has these fuzzy tails or this approximate locality. So it bleeds out of the cone a little bit. And this bleeding out of the cone is quantified by Lieb Robinson bounds that I think a bunch of you know, but some of you probably don't. And these just quantify this approximate light cone. And schematically, it's telling you that when you have local interactions, then you're going to get an approximate light cone, like I was just saying. And one of the points I want to convey to you is that you can ask about the converse. You can say, if I have dynamics that are unitary, and they have some approximate light cone, then the converse question would be to ask, are these dynamics generated by a local Hamiltonian? So this question I'll answer in 1D at least. And then it should be sort of obvious that this will, of course, also be related to QCAs and approximate QCAs. It's not totally necessary for the rest of the talk, but I think it's nice to actually see what an example of what a Lee Robinson bound is because it's sort of the primary motivating example for defining an approximate QCA. So here I'll give you a, a statement of the Lee Robinson bounds. So we'll be working with a 1D local lattice Hamiltonian. And the statement will roughly be that if we look at this operator here, it should be contained within the light cone. And the light cone should be diameter VT, where V is some velocity. And what that means for it to be approximately contained within the light cone is that there should be some other operator, a twiddle, which is like a truncated version of our operator. And if we truncate it to a region R that's bigger, that's bigger than the light cone, it should be a good approximation. So how do we formalize that? Well, the theorem is that there's some velocity V, and we say for any operator A and for any time T and any distance R, if R is sufficiently bigger than VT, then this exponential is small. And then a twiddle, there will be some a twiddle that is close to this operator A of T. So this is just formalizing what's in the picture. And uh, if you want to read Matt Hastings' review of locality in, you know, what, what's it called? Yeah. That's a great review to learn about the Lee Robinson bounds. Any questions so far? Yeah, cool. OK, so the point is that strict QCAs are not enough to tackle physical problems. And we've already basically seen why. The QCA maps local operators to strictly local operators. But let's say we take a local Hamiltonian, we fix a time t, and we consider this map that maps x to the conjugated x. And like we just saw, it's not going to be quite local, or at least it doesn't need to be. Lee Robinson bounds allow it to bleed outside of some uh, local region. So we want a notion of QCA that is more relaxed. OK, now I'll talk a tiny bit about operator algebras and QCAs and define approximate QCAs. And I'll even start, OK, I guess I'll start by just reminding you what a C star algebra is. The, the sort of topological details and the infinite dimensional stuff, it's not going to matter that much. This work that I'm talking about, it is rigorously proven on infinite lattices. And if you like that stuff, then feel free to talk to me about it. But I'll just be giving the high level gloss here. So a C star algebra, it's just a subset of linear operators on a Hilbert space. And it's an algebra. And it's also closed under the Hermitian adjoint or the star. And then there's also an abstract definition of this that doesn't require it to be represented on a Hilbert space. And I won't go through that, but the nice thing to remember is just that when you work with these abstract algebras, you don't need to worry, you don't need to think about the fact that the operators are acting on a vector space. And sometimes that's just nice from a practical point of view. OK, and since we've got a lot of category theorists, I can't tell you about an object without the morphisms. So 
what are typical morphisms of C star algebras? Well, they're just these algebra homomorphisms that you also require to play well with the star. And in particular, we'll be interested in automorphisms. So these are just the invertible ones. Now, this was touched on in the first talk today a little bit. I'll just repeat it here. So evolution is some unitary operator on the Hilbert space. And of course, it induces an automorphism of the operator algebra by conjugation. On the other hand, you could just start, you could say, scratch the unitary. I'm just going to start with an automorphism. And clearly, if you start at 1, then you get 2. If you start at 2, you could ask, is an automorphism going to be implemented by a unitary conjugation? This is true in finite dimensions. And in infinite dimensions, it's not quite true, but it's more or less true, and I won't go into it. But the point is we're going to prefer the algebra perspective. So from now on, I'll be talking about this map alpha acting on the algebra of observables. So a QCA. Oh, first let me divert into terminology for a second. So QCA, you know, I'm pointing at this board here now, is a quantum cellular automaton. It's sort of a crazy name. I think everyone I talk to agrees that it's sort of a crazy name. Then there's also LPU, locality preserving unitary, which is a little bit more evocative. And in our work, we decided to call these approximate QCAs ALPUs, so approximate locality preserving unitaries. Uh, I don't know what the right terminology should be, but <laughs> maybe in the social hour we can have a vote on what the official <laughs> QCA terminology would be. Uh, I know some of you probably preserve, uh, prefer LPU to QCA. Oh, so, so what I just mean is that if you start with this abstract algebra of, it depends which algebra you build, but if you build like the C star, the quasi-local C star algebra, and you just consider the shift automorphism, then that won't be implemented by a unitary in that C star algebra. You could represent it on a Hilbert space and then find a unitary that, you know, Yeah, you, you could do that. Or just, you wouldn't even need to pick your state post hoc. You could just pick the tracial state and look at that GNS representation, and your unitary would be in the Hilbert space, or would act on the Hilbert space. Yeah. But, uh, but that's the quasi local algorithm has a tracial space. Some, some, mm -hmm. some algorithm has a Oh, great. Yeah, I'll just be talking about the quasi local algebra. But either way, uh, I'm not going to dwell on that. So, OK, but what is a QCA? We've already seen, but we're going to consider this algebra, which is a tensor product of all of the algebras on each site. All of these local algebras are just these matrix algebras. And then what is in QCA or an LPU? Well, it's just this operator that preserves locality. So it has some finite range R. And when it acts on A, it'll expand A like this. Um, these diagrams that I draw are important to understand for the rest of the talk, so let me just be clear on what this is. It looks like there's two spin chains. Really, there's just one spin chain at the input and one spin chain at the output, and I'm just drawing the map alpha going upwards. Uh, so, you know, you have this operator A on this bottom region, and then you map it, and it ends up being supported on this top region. So hopefully that's a straightforward picture. And two great examples that you've been hearing about are circuits or shifts. These are both QCAs. And in fact, you already learned the GNVW classification, which to remind you says that these are basically the only two examples of 1D QCAs, which is to say that all 1D QCAs are compositions of circuits and shifts. But it's also good to remember the shift cannot be achieved by a circuit. And when we talk about classifying QCAs, at least in this one-dimensional context, or I guess in any context, we're going to be talking about classifying QC the, the group of QCAs modulo circuits. Yeah. 
these are just some examples of QCAs and what their GNVW index is. Um, maybe you like these pictures, maybe you don't. I see someone's making a face that they don't like these pictures. <laughs> so uh, these are these pictures are sort of like uh, matrix product operators or tensor network diagrams, if you like. So the input is just the bottom dots, the output is the top dots, and this is just a picture of a shift QCA. And if the QDIT has dimension D1, then the index is just going to be log D1. Now, oh, I'm using, yeah, I'm using the definition of the index where there's a logarithm. If you shifted the other way, you would get minus log D2. And then if you took the tensor product of these two QCAs, then the index would be additive and you would get log D1 minus log D2. I talked to some people where there was some confusion over what this tensor product of QCAs means, so let me just say it one more time. It's like you take your two spin chains and just stack them. And you do one QCA on one spin chain and the other QCA on the other spin chain. And it's additive under that tensor product. It's also additive under composition. Okay, and morally you can think of the index as the amount of information flowing right minus the amount of information flowing left. And I'm not going to dwell on this, but we actually reformulate the index as a mutual information so that, that those information words about how it's information flowing right versus left are sort of made more concrete and formal. But you can ask me about that later if you're interested. Okay, so now I'll finally define an ALPU. So I'll say that alpha is an ALPU with f of r tails, where f of r is going to be some function that decays to zero. It's going to quantify these tails. And the condition is going to be that when I take a, and then I look at alpha of a, which bleeds everywhere on the spin chain. That's yeah, sort of gruesome. It leaks everywhere on the spin chain. And then we want to ask how well can we approximate it when we restrict it to some neighborhood of radius r around the original support. And if we can find some a twiddle always that approximates alpha of a to within f of r in the operator norm, then we're going to call this an ALPU with f of r tails. OK, this is a really crucial definition for me. So does this make sense? Do you require anything on f, or are there conditions? Okay. I mean, I guess you can call it an ALP with f of r tails for any f you like, right. but the, the things that I'll prove will be true basically for any f that decays to zero. So it's pretty weak assumptions on the tails. Yeah? Uh, I'd like to ask the stop question. Uh, can you remind us what operator norm is? <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. So in finite dimensions, it would be the largest singular value. Uh, or the definition that would work in infinite dimensions, which is also true in finite dimensions, would be the maximum Hilbert space norm of the operator acting on a vector for a unit vector. So you maximize all unit vectors. So I'm sure you've heard that, but sometimes you forget which words are which norms. So. For each you yeah. find yes, that's right. So it's an exactly. So no matter what R you choose, you should be able to find a good approximation to error f of R. Okay, so some helpful notation that is also a useful concept to have in your head is this notion of approximate inclusions or epsilon near inclusions. And it's pretty simple. It's, I think it's due to Eric Christensen, although it's simple enough, I'm sure maybe someone wrote it down before. And all it means, we're going to write an inclusion like this of two algebras. But it's not going to actually be an inclusion. There's a little epsilon here. And what we mean is just that for any element in A, we can find an element in B that is close within epsilon. The reason there's an A on the right-hand side is just because uh, I don't know, imagine that A is norm one, and then that A would go away. OK, so this is a near inclusion. And now let me just say what ALPs are one more time, but using this near inclusion definition. OK, so 
Here was the definition we're working with for an ALPU. There needs to be some f of r that's decaying to zero. And then we're going to say that for every interval x and for every r, we have this condition here. So this condition is just telling you that the image of the algebra on x is contained within a ball of radius r and it's an epsilon inclusion. So this is the same thing I wrote down before. I'm just using this concept I introduced. Okay, and one example is QCAs are clearly ALPUs. Another example of an ALPU is Hamiltonian evolution. And the reason that it's an ALPU is because of the Lee Robinson bounds that I wrote down for you before. So the natural question to ask is, are these the only ALPUs? And the punchline again is that, yes, that will be the case in 1D, and we still don't know for higher dimensions. Any questions so far? Great. So like I said, we want to classify the space of ALPUs modulo local Hamiltonian evolution, or at least that seemed to us like the most natural thing to ask. Okay, so why is it not obvious? I mean, maybe you thought it was obvious what the answer was going to be. But uh, the GMVW index is only for these exact, uh, these exact locality conditions. And you might think, isn't it going to be sort of obvious or easy once we add some epsilons? And I don't have like a deep reason why it was actually hard. But maybe one reason is that the GMVW proof uses all these tools about algebras. And for instance, it talks about the algebra generated by some operators. But if I take, let's say I take uh, two operators and ask about the algebra they generate on a Hilbert space. And let's say they generate some proper subalgebra. If I now take those two operators and perturb them with a tiny bit of random operator in a random direction, so I have two very slightly different operators. Generically, they now generate the whole algebra on the Hilbert space. So the notion of how big an algebra do you generate is, very, is just infinitely brittle under perturbations. So that's why at least the techniques that they used in their paper weren't going to immediately work. Um, yeah, and the, the GMBW index has been, the argument for it was sort of reframed in uh, Hastings and Friedman and then again in Ha's paper. But those arguments also, they're sort of more natural, but they're still sort of brittle in this way, where it's not obvious what happens when you add a little bit of noise. OK, and then a question that we had was, should the index still be quantized when there's these tails? Because, was there a question? No. Because um, the quantization of the index has to do with the fact that you've got what I shouldn't have gone back. It has to do with the fact that you transfer a qubit or a qtrit, and then that gives you a 2 or a 3. And if instead these qubits aren't being sort of directly translated, but they're sort of leaking out over the whole chain, you might wonder whether there's actually still some uh, integers involved or not. And it turns out that there are, but it sort of wasn't obvious from the get-go. I'll mention one more upshot of all of this is um, maybe if you're a physicist, you've wondered before, can we write down a momentum density on the lattice? So what do I mean by that? So you know, the Hamiltonian is like, a hem is like an energy density. All the local terms are like an energy density. And they generate time translations. A momentum density on the lattice should be a local operator, so a sum of local terms that, sorry, when I say local operator, usually I mean supported on a single region. But when physicists talk about like a Hamiltonian being a local operator or a momentum density being a local operator, they mean a sum of local terms. Anyway, so you might wonder, is there a sum of local terms that generates translations? And from the GNVW result, you might have thought, probably not, because circuits can't generate translations. But it, it wasn't clear whether Hamiltonian evolution could generate a translation. But it turns out that that also cannot generate a translation. OK, and one more motivation is it would be nice if we could take these 
results about the stability of chiral many-body localized Floquet phases that you heard about earlier today and turn those into some rigorous math theorems. And you basically can using the results I'm talking about, but there's some, or a little bit short of applying it to the edge of a 2D bulk. So that's something that someone could work on in the future. Okay, so like I was saying, the classification turns out pretty much the same. So you do 1D ALPs modulo time-dependent quasi-local Hamiltonians, and that gives the same index theory. And I'll just say a little more on this result. So not only are they characterized by this quantized index, but you can take any ALPU and approximate it with a sequence of QCAs. That's actually basically the proof method that I'll talk about. And every ALPU will be the composition of a time-dependent local Hamiltonian with a shift. The time dependence of the local Hamiltonian is actually necessary. You couldn't get away with just a, a time-independent local Hamiltonian, and that's due to some, some results fairly recently by others where they realized that you couldn't do this with a time-independent Hamiltonian. Now, for the finite open chain, so what I've been talking about is an infinite chain. So we're talking about the integers, say, as our lattice. If instead you restrict to an interval, then the index is going to end up being 0, which means that any ALPU on an interval will be generated by some Hamiltonian. And actually, we were unable to solve the case of S1. So if you have an ALPU on S1, then I don't know what happens when you add, I, I don't know what the classification is. I strongly expect it's the same GNBW index for an S1, but we weren't able to show that yet. Oh, sorry, I don't mean open in the sense of an open system. I'm just, yeah, yeah, yeah. People say that sometimes. Yep. Um, and as a result, also, you know, there's, there's no local momentum density like I alluded to before. Okay, now I'm going to sketch the proof technique. Actually, before I sketch the proof technique, I think I have enough time. Let me just say some words about what you might have tried and why it wouldn't quite work. So here's our lattice. So we look at the image of an operator here, and it sort of has these tails like this. And you might have said, OK, well, let's just truncate the operator. Because by definition, we have these good truncations that are good approximations of the operator. So we take A, we take alpha of A, and then we truncate it to some A twiddle that is perfectly supported on some region. So let's just say we truncate everything. So what goes wrong? Well, our map is now local, but it's no longer in algebra automorphism because when you truncate these tails, they no longer satisfy the multiplicative property. And you might try to directly repair this multiplicative property, because there is some literature that goes under the name of Ulam stability, where you have a morphism of some algebraic object, and the target is some metric space. And instead of being an exact morphism, it's actually a morphism up to some epsilon. So people consider this type of problem. And then they ask, can we slightly deform this map to make it an actual morphism? And in many cases, you're able to do that. Um, in this case here, if you cut off the tails, and then you have this approximate morph homomorphism, you could deform it to get it to be an exact homomorphism. But it would only be for this region here. And then if you did it separately for a region over here, so now I take this algebra and I, or let me say instead, I take this algebra now, 
I take this algebra and I look at its image and it has some tails and I cut off those tails and then I look at this approximate homomorphism and then I also deform that to make it a homomorphism. The issue will be is that these images of these two different regions won't commute. So even though I had a nice homomorphism here and a nice homomorphism here, I won't have a homomorphism for the whole chain if I use that sort of strategy. Anyway, I just wanted to run through that because these, these Oolong stability ideas are pretty cool if you haven't heard of them before, but that's not a proof method that we were able to get directly to work. Okay, so what is the main tool that I want to tell you about? Well, uh, there's this method for taking a near inclusion and perturbing it to make it an exact inclusion. So this is this theorem from Eric Christensen. So we have two algebras, A and B. We have this near inclusion. And then the result will be that there is some unitary such that you can rotate A into B. And that unitary will be a small rotation controlled by the size of that near inclusion. And not only that, but the unitary will be generated by the algebras A and B, which will be useful. So anyone have any questions on this, this concept here? Uh, is it that the finite dimension of your space? No, no. So, so this is separable H. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we'll be using it on the infinite case. Can you just remind me what near inclusion means? Yeah, so it's at the bottom of the page here again. Mm -hmm. So an inclusion is just when something's a subset. And a near inclusion is just we're in this metric space and it's almost a subset, but not quite. And then in particular, it's quantified in this way. So every element is epsilon close in the following way. Assuming that the theorem, uh, you have epsilon less than 1 over 8, is there something special about that? Like, the, could I put something else that it would be like, you know, instead of 12 times epsilon, it would be something else times epsilon? Like, what, why would I do Um, I think the true constant might be like 1 half. I asked someone once whether to put numerical constants in slides, and they said, if the integers are small enough, you include them. So I thought, these are small integers. I don't know. <laughs> I think, you know, you, you have something that's like, you know, probably a lot smaller than 1 8. Uh, but <laughs> I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, if epsilon were, like, uh, if it were an eighth, then this, this, this right-hand side here would also be bigger. So, you know. Yeah, I know. I, I felt sort of, there's been like all this beautiful algebra and category theory, and I almost felt bad throwing up some analysis like this, but here it is. <laughs> yeah. So oh, oh, what, you mean like in the, group. sorry, it uses a contraction, but no, I, not what you mean. It doesn't use a... Sorry, in operator algebra, sometimes you call a certain map a contraction, but I don't think it's a contraction mapping in the way that you mean. Yeah. It, so I could prove this for one of you later if you're interested. The main tool, once you strip away all of the crazy operator algebra and write the proof in finite dimensions, the main tool is that if I have two projectors that are close, just like normal projectors in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, if you do, you look at their polar decompositions and you figure out a formula for a unitary that rotates one projector into the other projector. And now we want to somehow do this for algebras. So we go to the Steinspring representation, which is a tool familiar if you know quantum information theory. And in this Steinspring expanded space, you do the same trick with rotating one projector into the other projector. Okay, but this, let's just black box this. The, the cool fact is that if an algebra is almost inside another algebra, you rotate it a little bit, and then it's exactly inside the algebra. Um, is, 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 uh, in the strong operator closure of A and B? 
Um, yes, yes. I just said algebra generated by, but what I mean is the double commutant. So. OK, so what's an application of this? Well, the way that we will use it is we're going to use it to strictly localize the images of regions. So on the left-hand side, we have our ALPU. And the image, which is, or again, this top row is like the image, and it's leaking everywhere. But by our definition of the ALPU, it's the image is going to be a pro the image algebra here is going to be approximately contained within some algebra in this ball, the algebra of operators on this ball. So, just directly from this perturbation of the operator algebra result, that means that you can slightly rotate the image and then get it to be exactly localized. So to be totally concrete, we apply this theorem, we find some unitary U that rotates the image into its exactly localized algebra. We take our ALPU, or our approximate QCA, we compose it with this unitary conjugation, and now we get a new ALPU, which it's not a QCA yet. In fact, there's a lot more work to do, but we did one thing, which is we took the image of this region and we managed to localize it. Uh, yeah, any questions on that? I'll pause for a second. Is it obvious that the U being post identity implies that it is not a preserved? Oh, so, so the U being close to the identity isn't what tells you that, that's not what tells you that the image of this region is now exactly localized. That just follows from the, from the assumption from the result that right. u is going to exactly put you into b. But I guess my question is, you know, what happens to the other side of your know, Oh, great. So because u is close to the identity, then not too much can happen on the rest of the chain. Okay. And you might even further want to know that when you look really far away on the chain, that nothing, that the, that how much is happening over here is decaying like your tails on your ALPU. So we prove some corollaries to Christensen's theorem that show that as well. So the point is that we localize this region, and if we have exponential tails on our ALPU, if you look far away, then exponentially nothing has happened. Uh, does that make sense? No? <laughs> yeah, feel free to ask later or more. Uh, maybe to, maybe I'll try one, I don't know if this is answering your question, but if U is close to the identity, then this new ALPU, alpha twiddle, is close to alpha, of course, so. Basically, you could think about it like that. It's not quite written on this slide, and I won't quite go into it now, but you, so U as an operator is actually still epsilon far from the identity. It's not going to be much closer because it really does need to localize all of this. So it can't be too small because it really needs to cut off those tails. But the point is that when it acts via conjugation on stuff that was really far over here, it's going to do almost nothing. So its action on other parts of the chain is going to be really suppressed by the tail. OK, so I'll finish the proof sketch in the next five or 10 minutes, which is what I have. And I think hopefully you'll be sort of able to see how the pictures go. And what we'll do is we'll try to approximate the ALPU with the QCA. And the way we'll try to do that is by taking all of these leaky tails and rotating them into themselves, rotating them smaller, and doing it in a way that we still have an algebra homomorphism. 
because if we contract these tails and then we contract these tails, we need to sort of do it in such a way that the tail, the, the images of the two regions still commute. So we still have a homomorphism. So that's what I'm showing you on this slide. So this slide is actually the entirety of the proof sketch. And let me explain this for a few minutes now. So at the top of the screen, we have our original ALPU. And these, this yellow bar here is just denoting a unitary that we're going to compose the ALPU with as our first step. And then on the right-hand side, what I've drawn is the effect of applying this unitary. So this trapezoid notation means that let me change my pen. This trapezoid notation means that this whole region here, when you look at its image, it's exactly localized to this whole region here. That's what these trapezoids mean. Actually, does anyone, if you don't understand what this trapezoid notation means, then it's hopeless to understand the slide. So does anyone want to ask about, yeah? Yeah, when you said it's localized to that region, what is it there? Great, so I'm going to take the algebra on this region and let me call that A. And then I'm going to consider alpha of A. And when I draw a trapezoid like this, what I mean is that alpha of A is localized to this region here. There is implicitly somewhere off the slide the other side of the trapezoid as well? Or are you doing so, this so, so this, this uh, Yeah, I'm doing this on a whole half, on a semi-infinite half of the system. So after this first step, what's going to happen is a whole half chain is going to be localized. So let me explain how you do that. So by the assumption that it's an ALPU, which again would have followed from the Lee Robinson bounds, say, from that we're going to know that this whole, oops, This whole half chain in the input, its image is going to be leaked over the whole chain, but it's going to be approximately contained within this region here. I should have said I'm considering range one. I'm considering tails that drop off a lot after just a single site. If you coarse grain enough, then you'll always have tails that drop off steeply after a single site. This is sort of like saying how Earlier, implicitly, we were working with QCAs that had range 1. When you saw some of the pictures, those were implicitly range 1 QCAs, and it's because we can always coarse grain until they have range 1. OK, so this algebra A, it's, it's the half chain algebra. Its image is going to be approximately within this slight neighborhood of the half chain. And then we're just going to use this perturbation result that I mentioned to rotate that algebra into the exact half chain algebra. So. This bar means that we're doing a unitary on the whole chain, and we're going we're gonna to compose with alpha. And then after, we're going to get this slightly modified ALPU that has this localization property of the half chain. OK, the next step that we do is we're going to find some unitary that is being, that's going to act just on this region. And the effect of that unitary is that I'm going to get this additional trapezoid of localization. And I won't try to explain exactly which unitary that is, but you, you can ask me later if you're interested. You sort of play around with images and pre-images, and you like rotate the pre-image onto the right pre-image, and then you get this other trapezoid of localization. OK, you do a few more steps, and eventually you have this ALPU that in a small region looks like a QCA. And now you repeat this whole process, but instead you do it over here. So you, you start fresh, and you generate a different ALPU that looks like a QC on this region. Then you start the process over again, and you generate a different ALPU that looks like a QCA on this region. And afterwards, we have all these different ALPUs 
that in some region look like a QCA, but on different regions for each ALP. Then we take all of those and we blend them together. Blending, I think it was mentioned very briefly, is when you take two QCAs and you, uh, you have a QCA1 over here and QCA2 over here and you blend them together and you can only do that when they have the same index. So we take all these ALPs that have been localized on a region and we blend them together and the result is that you get a QCA. Now you can do this with any coarse graining you like. Next question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just to understand, on the second line, the reason the green is drawn only where it is, is that because after you've done the first line, you know that any operator to the left of the trapezoid, because of this commutativity, has to map to something not contained where the green is. You know that the but just because, like, since the right is strictly local, how it maps can map only so far to the left side. Stuff on the left can only go Yeah, yeah you're, you're sort of asking, like, it's sort of nice that this second unitary was only able to, we could restrict it to acting here, and yet it was still able to localize this trapezoid. And the reason, like you're saying, is that, I'm just sort of repeating, the reason is that before we did this, there was some if we looked at this half chain, it bled a little bit into this region, but it surjected onto this region. And because it surjected onto that region, we didn't need to deform the ALP on that region. But and did you need did you need this in it? Would it have been okay if the green was the entire thing? Or? Um, I forget about that step in particular, but in general, we need. Yeah, it can, in general, so like, let's look at this step here. Yeah. I, I apply this purple unitary, and it's only on this region. Yeah. And the important part about it being localized here when I apply it is that it doesn't mess up the other localizations. Right? If, so I do this step, and I get an additional trapezoid of localization, and I didn't want it to mess up the fact that this region was localized. And then when you say, second question, when you say you blend, so like you're saying that the QCA here, in like one little block, and QCA in another little block. But you have an additional constraint that you want to blend it in some way that mimics what the original ALP you did in between. So then you know that you can do that. Yeah, so you have this QCA, you have an, yeah. You have an ALP that looks like a QCA in this region, and then a different ALP that looks like a QCA on this overlapping region. And it just turns out that you're able, to, since they sort of agree on their overlap. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sorry, I thought it was one right. So, so you, yeah, you repeat the procedure on overlapping regions. And since they agree on their overlap approximately, the blend is small. You're using something about that you, you're working on infinite mind rather than on a circle. Yeah. What's that? It's sort of apparent in the first step already. So I can't give you a deep reason why this doesn't work on S1, because basically I think it should ultimately work. But the, what goes wrong is on step one, I localize a half chain, and there just is no half chain on S1. Um, you might instead try to just localize half the circle. What would go wrong is that you would localize half the circle, and then you would start localizing things moving left. And as you got back around to where you started, you would mess up the localization you did in the first place. Uh, I could explain more later. But basically, yeah, you, you move around the circle, sort of cinching in your tails. And by the time you get back to where you started, you, there's some inconsistency, at least in the way that we set it up. There shouldn't be. but. Yeah, great. I, I just didn't say. So the orange at the bottom means that, so at the top, these were unitaries that we're applying that we post-compose post -compose conjugation onto the ALPU. Mm -hmm. The unitaries at the bottom were pre-composing conjugations onto, onto the ALPU. Is so all these unitaries supported on some half one? Yeah. Well, I guess the top one is supported everywhere. 
because in that very first step, we need to access everywhere on the chain in order to cinch in the tails. But afterwards, they're supported on half lines. Sorry, uh, the first step, is that supported on a contact region or the entire chain? Um, the entire chain, sorry. Yeah. And, and its purpose is to, do what? Its purpose is to localize the right half chain, but because the right half chain initially leaks everywhere, in order to rotate it back to its proper place on the right, you're going to need to do something everywhere. You need to, it's leaking everywhere, so you've got to collect it from everywhere and put it onto the right half chain. So it's yeah, so yeah, this yellow bar is supposed to be stretched over the whole chain, even though it's not doing much to the edges. So the upshot of all of this is that I mentioned there was this definition of the GNVW index that used mutual information. I didn't exactly tell you how it worked. I just said there's this definition using mutual information. And it turns out that that exact same definition using mutual information will work in the infinite chain with these leaky tails. And it will give you um, an integer or you know, a, a difference of logs of integers if we're working with the logarithmic definition of the index. So it gives you this discrete index even on the infinite chain. And maybe one way to see that is that we're approximating this ALPU with QCAs. And like I was starting to say before, if I, so I do this whole process, I get a QCA. It has some error. If I instead coarse grain the, the ALPU and then I try to get a QCA out of it, when I coarse grain, the tails are now smaller, because I coarse grained. So there's less error in this construction. So now I have a better QCA approximation that is long, longer range. So basically, I keep increasing my range that I allow myself, and I keep getting better and better QCA approximations. And for each of those QCAs, the index is discrete. And then it turns out that the index also then ends up being discrete for the full ALPU because the index is sufficiently continuous with respect to changing the, the ALPU. So, by, so I say it's continuous, well, it's discrete, but that means that it's not going to change as I change my ALPU. And th that continuity of the index, one way to think about it is that it comes from continuity bounds that you have on mutual information that people know about. So by expressing this index as a mutual information, it gives you a good estimate of how much the index is allowed to change when you change the underlying QCA or ALPU. OK, that's about my time. This is stuff I already, I already told you. Um, yeah, for my last slide of content, I'll just say, so far, I told you that the ALPUs had an index, and I told you that you could approximate them with QCAs. And then what I didn't go into detail about yet was the fact that you can, if it's index zero, you can achieve the ALPU with a time-dependent quasi-local Hamiltonian evolution. So what is that time-dependent quasi-local Hamiltonian evolution? Well, honestly, it's a little bit cheap. It's sort of shown in this picture here. You take, the, you take the QCA, you take a, sorry, you approximate your ALPU by a QCA, and then you implement that, and then that QCA is index zero if we're working with an index zero ALPU. So it's really a circuit. So then you implement the circuit using Hamiltonian time evolution. Whenever you have a circuit, you can implement it using a time-dependent Hamiltonian because you just turn on each gate one by one. OK, so now we approximated the ALPU with a Hamiltonian. We didn't get there yet. So what we do next is we take our next level QCA approximation. That has slightly longer range, but it's slightly more accurate. And then we do a little bit more Hamiltonian evolution until we get to the slightly more accurate QCA. And then we keep doing this, and we keep speeding it up as we do it. And ultimately, you get this Hamiltonian evolution that achieves the ALPU. And you might worry that 
Like, in what sense is this a constant depth Hamiltonian evolution? Because if I let the norm of the Hamiltonian terms get too large, it's sort of cheating, because then it's like I go for a really long time in my evolution. But there's also uh, good behavior on the norms of the Hamiltonian. So you have this, this bounded Hamiltonian, uniformly bounded n terms, and we evolve for a finite time, and we get the ALPU. So that's the sort of result that you would hope for. Faster than, I mean, it has to decay faster than long growth. Like yeah, yeah. So I, I told you that the tails could decay any way you wanted. Th that is true, except for this result. When you do Hamiltonian evolution, it needs to go like 1 over log r, which is not too bad. Yeah. They are getting more and more non-local, but they're also getting smaller and smaller. So as time goes on, the range of the Hamiltonian we're using increases, but we're only doing a tiny bit of evolution. So it's fair to say that this is a quasi-local Hamiltonian evolution. And what does quasi-local Hamiltonian mean? It means that you're allowed arbitrarily long-range terms, but the terms can't be too big. So, so that's what we have. We have sort of a uniformly quasi-local Hamiltonian evolution that depends on time. Okay, I'll take any other questions. I think I'm done now, so.